Hi, welcome to our interview show in which we interview LGBTQ guests who are important contributors to our community. We want to acknowledge that All Things LGBTQ is produced at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which is unceded indigenous land. Enjoy the show. Everybody, I'm here with a distinguished trio of editors and publishers of a new uh, exciting publication coming out of Brooklyn called WIM, W-M-N, Zine. Um, we have with us designer, Venezuelan designer, artist Florencio Alvarado, American photographer, Jeanette Spicer, and Swedish designer, Sarah Duell. They are the dykes behind WMN, a publication of lesbian art and poetry. If I'm reading from their statement now, we have individually come to identify ourselves as lesbians in different ways and at various times, but found commonality between our love for WMN and interest in art and representation of marginalized communities. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that later in the interview. When thinking of our own identifications, we realized that the term lesbian was in ways a signifier of the past and could even be considered radical. I consider it radical. Uh, the, this awareness sparked our inspiration and desire to gather and share work of other people identifying as lesbian in order to create a conversation around different terms of identification and how and why we use them. This scene is meant to provide a much needed space to show the intimacy, struggle, wonder, and everything in between of what it means to be a lesbian in this political climate and time. What an exciting project. Now we have uh, three editors with us and I'd like to give you a little more specific information about them individually um, because they're distinguished um, figures in their own rights. And then we'll start talking about the zine. So let's start with Sarah Duell, who is a Swedish designer who works at the intersection of art and graphic design with a focus on visual literacy and social justice. She also writes about the hidden politics of visual language. Florencia Alvarado, is a Venezuelan visual artist, photographer, and designer based in Brooklyn. Everybody's based in Brooklyn, right? At this point? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Her work explores post-photography, feminism, the body, and the deconstruction of photography through digital art and collage. Jeanette Spicer is an American visual artist working with photography, video, and mixed media. Her work raises questions around intimacy, the lesbian gaze, physical and psychological boundaries, and the body as it relates to space. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, very exciting. Um, let's, you know, I have looked at the two issues that you've brought out, and I have to say they're very elegant. Would you mind showing them? Yes. Uh -huh. One is called Seasons of a Dyke and the other Show Me What You Got. <laughs> I love those titles. Um, but they're so elegant. When I see that you've labeled the publication as zine, my zine, I became confused because of course, many people think of zines as stapled, mimeographed manifestos that circulate on the street. But um, when I looked up the definition, um, I have discovered that the descriptor fits perfectly. A zine is an, according to Google, is a not-for-profit targeted audience with a targeted audience, limited editions, and it, reflect, it reflects the editor's vision. That corresponds with what you're doing, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you were founded in Brooklyn. Of course, my first question is, how did you happen to get together and decide to do this? Um, well, I think Sarah and I were first discussing um, 
having a lesbian publication and just well really first discussing more the lack of um the term lesbian in kind of mainstream culture and media and just conversations in the queer community and we feel like it's a term that people maybe shy away from um especially since the term queer has sort of regained a big following recently and so we were just thinking about that as a concept and as lesbians and as artists and how could we um, try to promote the term more, try to support people who identify as lesbian and were interested in other artists. So we thought maybe we could create some sort of platform, artistic platform. And then we, you know, thinking about the fact that we do have a lot of privilege and we are living in a space um, that is filled with 8 million people. Um, and has a pretty big art platform and a lot of support here. Um, we didn't wanna just create another lesbian publication that focuses on you know, maybe younger lesbians living in a city that's um, already has a huge art scene. So we wanted to think about how can we use our privilege to support um, other people who might not be in positions to be quite as supported as, as we might be artistically. And then I spoke we spoke, I don't really remember, with Florencia um, to see if she might be interested in joining as well as someone who's a photographer and a designer. So I thought it would be a nice sort of mix of different backgrounds and different visions and different artistic interests. And that's really how it started. And we would meet at different people's apartments and chat and have um, some dinner and go over how we want to get this thing started and what we're interested in focusing on. And, and then we kind of proceed that way, like still to this day. Um, COVID, of course, has created a little bit of, um, you know, challenge, but we usually do Zoom meetings or sometimes we will meet at a distance in person. So we're still really keeping up um, weekly or monthly meetings. And it's always kind of a focus on something different depending on what we're working on. But that's really how we got started and then that's our process. How do you solicit individual contributions? So we do, um, for each issue, we have a theme and within that theme, we um, we use that in, the, in, in public open calls um, that are usually spread through social media and through word of mouth. Um, we've found that that is the most effective way. Um, and yeah. So it's primarily through word of mouth. And we do some outreach to help like get some sense of, um, <clears throat> yeah, just to like, if there's people that we look up to or that we know of who are in, in the group that we are trying to solicit from, we will ask them if, if they want to contribute or if they know more people that might know, might be interested in contributing. I discovered you because I'm Facebook friends with Jed. Mm -hmm. Been following her work for years, and I'm a great admirer. <clears throat> and you know, she posted that she was being published in your um, in your zine, and it, it was just a pleasure to discover you and read what you're up to, and the lesbian focus, the whole nine yards is great. I think. Um, let's talk about your limited edition. Oh, that's wonderful. That's, that's you know, that's that's but pardon me. I know the other. I don't want to be too specific, but why not? The other um, Jeb photograph is of the founders of Kitchen Table Women of Color Press. And that really resonated with me. That's yep. a good one too. That really resonated with me because I was at that conference where that mm -hmm. picture was taken. I was so, I was so excited. I know, I know. So, um, pardon me? Oh, sorry, here. This is, this is that important. one, that one. It was a beautiful day in DC. And there was such promise in that uh, series that they brought out. I, I have an abiding interest in women in print, as you can tell. But, <laughs> I love it. Um, let's talk about the limited editions, if we could. Um, you start your first issue sold out and then you had to do another run. Is that correct? Yeah, so we were, um, I think also part of why we, we've also used the word scene to describe it at first was um, a, an attempt at modern, it was trying to be a little bit modest because we didn't really know 
where we would go and what the outcome would be. Um, even though we knew that we wanted to make something that felt very valuable and special um, because we have a fairly niche audience. And uh, so we started off, we actually started off when we first started talking to the printers saying, oh, we're gonna just print a hundred or maybe 150 books. And then um, the way that we fund the books is through pre-sales. So even before the, uh, the books were printed, we ask people to order, pre-order their copy. Um, and that is the way that we fund the publication. Um, and, but then we realized that there was so much interest that we had to print 200. But even after we printed the 200, we realized quickly that we were gonna sold, uh, sell out, which we did. And then we had to, then we printed another 200 when we printed the second issue um, that we started off at a 400. Um, we had product. the support of a couple of um, websites, Instagram grant accounts that mm -hmm. pushed our followers, um, like Autostraddle, they, in, they, they did an interview to us that it was really nice. And we connect to a lot of people, like followers through them. Um, that was at the beginning, right, of mm -hmm. our journey. And then we also had another participation with another uh, lesbian digital, very popular platform on online. And that also uh, gave us followers. And that's, that's a really, uh, easy way to connect with people who's interested in a target target account information so yes i mean be, because of our followers uh the people who support us that's how how we been doing the sales the yeah the sales. well it's so elegant that before i looked up the definition of zine i was thinking you know you might have called it journal and so forth but Zine has a really populist flavor too that fits with your uh, goals, I believe. Um, you publish twice a year, roughly? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you have theme issues. The first issue kind of focused on rural lesbians and the um, second issue, show me what you got is lesbians of a certain age, 55 or older. Mm -hmm. Um, why theme issues and not, you know, are you wedded to theme issues for the rest of your publication history? Or? Well, I think the theme sort of is, the term theme shows up differently in both of the issues. Um, so the first issue, the title Seasons of a Dyke, um, we had an open call for people that lived in rural areas of the US or smaller cities, but we also wanted to have a little bit of a theme um, and that played out in the title, so Seasons of a Dyke, and people could sort of approach that in an open-ended way. And any kind of seasonal inspiration or something they went through in, during a certain time throughout a year or a season was welcome. And again, we do visual art and we, we call it visual art and poetry, but we've expanded a little more, I think, into prose or different types of writing. We do have, you know, a limit. We can't put a short novel in there, but we, it doesn't just have to be poems. So I think that that's a really nice thing. And so I think for now we're pretty aligned with the theme because it sort of inspires the title, which then inspires the design. And it, it really, I think is the foundation of what makes it interesting and, and artistic for us because we're doing the design, but um, I think it's pretty fun to come up with the title and the theme to sort of, you know, show me what you got. You might see that in a store and you might not know at all what this is about. Um, Seasons of a Dyke is maybe a little bit more forward, but I think we'll probably play with words and play with design to see what makes sense for the issue so that it's seen in the best light. And that really depends on the theme. But yeah, I think the themes are, are fundamental for us. And, and very exciting too. We have, with the, with the one that we're working right now, we we knew that we, we, we made lists at the, at the beginning. Remember we used to, we made a list with like lots of stuff that we were interested in. Mm -hmm. And 
there's so many things that need to be you know address and mm -hmm. get more light and information and discussion so it's just yeah. it's 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 good for us also the theme team is very interesting because we learn we get to learn through every different specific things that we are committing we uh we learn and that's one of the most important and rich part of the process for mm -hmm. us i think too well, you're self-supporting, so would you mind telling us a little bit about how you raise funds to bring out each issue? So, as we mentioned before, we we primarily do pre-sales. Um, so, as we are announcing the issues or we're closing up the issues, we ask people to pre-order copies. Um, but we have also just recently started um, selling uh, t-shirts as well as handkerchiefs um, as a nod to the on our backs flagging handkerchiefs um, in 18 different colors you can wear in your back pocket um, or not you can do you can wear you can use them however you want in um, many ways you can use them in many ways and um, so that has selling the books and selling the merchandise have helped us sustain ourselves um, and the project. And the audience can get purchase this merchandise by going to wmnzine.com, correct? Yes. And there's a whole lineup. <laughs> yes. Also in, an, in our Instagram, we are updating with news and collaborations with some other um, platforms or stuff. We have, we got an invitation to design like a special t-shirt recently. So we are selling through also a t-shirt like a special design through them. Uh, we are full of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So we are um, always trying to update stuff in our website and social media. Just you can follow. Everyone can follow us there and get to know more of our little and big projects. Well, the interview time is elapsing. But before we go, uh, I'd like to ask each of you for a final message to our audience. and. Before you start, thank you so much for coming. This has been great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that one of our main, since so much of our work is, um, relies on support, like just followers and support and word of mouth and people talking about the project. Um, just, I wanna encourage everyone who sees this to follow us on Instagram follow our updates on our website um, as we release the open call for the next issue to spread the word about that issue. Our open calls are always free. So we, ex when whoever fills the criteria that we set for each theme uh, are welcome to apply. We are also, you're also welcome to email us if you have any questions. All that information is on the website. Very good. Yeah. We also have a website that we are uh, like a feature, like a kind of a blog that it's growing uh, with collaborations from writers or interviews, filmmakers. We want to also grow in, like we want to create an archive there, like a digital archive. Um, so that's another thing. Maybe sometimes uh, not everyone feels on the open call theme. But we are always uh, accepting and very open to publish and take a look of poets, writers to publish them in our website. So that's another thing that we have. And also um, we are starting to make um, Zoom talks, artist talks through Zoom, uh, which is, we have, we'll have one really soon and it's gonna be really exciting with a photographer, Lola Flash. So that's, all, that's also a very interesting. We want to get more involved into more education, educational stuff digitally. Be, I mean, be assumed because of the circumstance, but it's also like a new way to connect and promote some other lesbians, folks, uh, friends, works. Jeanette. Yes. Uh, so I'll probably just go off of what Valencia and Sarah already said, which is, um, all of those things, but also we have, and the artist talk is on November 17th. Um, so 
we have a, a way that you can register on our website. It's the right on the front page. It's super easy. And so that'll be Tuesday, November 17th at 5 p.m. Eastern time with Lola Flash, who's a lesbian photographer. And um, so the, I guess the last thing that I'll say is that our next theme is going to be, you know, we don't have a title yet. We haven't opened the open call, but we are looking to work with people who identify as lesbian and as disabled who make visual art and poetry or prose pieces. So for anyone listening, if anyone identifies that way, it's an international call, or you know someone who might be interested, we will be looking for people to submit very, very soon within the next few weeks. Wonderful. Well, editors and publishers of WMN Zine, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you for having us. And thank you. And tonight we have Preston Allen, who is the proud author of The Coven Sun. Yes, and we'll have your site up. I mean, we'll have your website up so people can go and order the book um, and see the interview. So let me tell you a little bit about Preston. He's a government licensed professional and author of The Coven's Son. While a background of fantasy costume construction and acting for the world-renowned vacation resort, he is now adding author to his list of achievements. Preston graduated top of his class from Palm Beach State College. In his free time, he enjoys traveling foreign countries, exploring interesting cuisine, and visiting theme parks. So welcome to the show, Preston. Thank you. Great to be here. So you're a Florida person. Have you lived there all your life or did you transplant there? Uh, we came down to Florida with my family when I was about 10 from Pennsylvania and we've been here ever since. Okay, and, and you've been in the mostly in the Lauderdale area and? I was in South Florida in West Palm Beach um, until I was about 21 and then I moved up to Orlando, which is where I'm at right now. Good, well that, that accounts for the theme parks maybe. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So did you always think of yourself as a writer or is this something that sort of came to you later in life or? Yeah, on and off. Um, when I was growing up, I always had like interest in writing short stories and things like that, um, but I never really pursued anything. Um, and there was a large gap where I really didn't do anything at all, but definitely from around, I'd say probably 10 to about 20 is when I really was interested in it. And then you kind of just came back to it. Yeah, I came back to it after um, after a conversation uh, with my husband who really pushed me to get this book out because I, I kind of started it uh, when I was 17 and just never did anything with it. Yeah, well, it's out now and it sounds just incredibly uh, interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do you did fantasy costume construction. Yes. And, and what was that about? Was that like... Um, for horror films or is that it the was it was for competition uh -huh. um it was at the you know the cosplay conventions but back when i was doing it i i think honestly i might get some slack for this but now it's more of a popularity contest rather than it is about construction of the uh -huh. actual costume itself um but back when i did it it was really about hand making uh, garments. And so I have, I believe it's six awards um, for construction of those costumes. And, and what and what were they like costumes for? They were from like comic books or Japanese anime or video games. Anime, yes. I yeah. Know. yeah. Um, and, uh, and you graduated from Palm Beach State College. Mm -hmm. um, was your major in English or did you? No, it was cosmology. Really? Yes, I am a makeup artist and hairstylist. Great. And that accounts for the co uh, costumes too, right? I mean, yeah, anything, you know, artistic related, I was always into. And I did all the wigs for the, for the costumes to match the characters. So is there an LGBTQ theme in your book? There is a lesbian character who is the owner of the metaphysical shop where they buy all their supplies. Uh -huh. um, I wanted to incorporate that in there somewhere, but I didn't want it to be a main focus of the story uh, because I wanted 
kind of the main character to be who you want them to be. So I kind of left that very neutral. So this, this would be considered fantasy. Yes, fantasy and magical so, realism. So I, I, I guess the difference between like fantasy and science fiction is like um, making up your own countries and your own, not that science fiction doesn't do that either, but I'm always a little, can you explain, do you know, like what is the difference between science fiction and fantasy? I mean, I, mean, I know it when I see it, but it's kind of yeah. like, in mine, in my mind, I feel science fiction is going to be more, um, more future based, or if it is current times, it's more technologically advanced than what where we're currently at. Mm -hmm. um, whereas fantasy is more of like that magical, uh, you know, fairies and mushrooms and and dragons and things yeah. like that. Whereas the sci-fi would be more of like the outer worldly and and scientific aspect of things. Yeah, that's what I was, you know, like I was thinking, you know, it, it's it, it's kind of like a combination, but I, I think it's probably more science fiction I think of as like machinery and stuff too. Like. Yeah, yeah, and things like, yeah, and like, um, you know, technological advancements from other planets and galaxies and things like that. It's funny that you mentioned that because just yesterday I found that the book was actually categorized, I think it was on... Um, Apple books, it's categorized under science fiction fantasy. And I had never seen my book under that category before. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, it could probably fit into both, but I, I think of fantasy as kind of like creating spaces, creating worlds and people within those worlds. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily be even recognizable as earth, although it could be. Yeah, yeah, that is entirely possible. Mine is is definitely set in our world, but it's kind of like a world no one else sees. Yeah. Um, so you continue, you want to write another book? Is it going to be a series or is this? Yeah, so the idea is going to be every other book will be a sequel to this one. So the one I'm working on right now is going to be its own standalone, unrelated to the Coven Sun. And then based on the success of that, we'll do a sequel to The Coven Sun. And ultimately, um, the goal is a trilogy for The Coven Sun. So could you tell us a little bit about the book um, before you read for us? Sure. Uh, um, so the book is basically, it's about the first witch that has been born as a male in over 250 years. Um, when, when you think of witch, you think of generally it's women, women with the hats and, and everything with the cloaks and <laughs> who uh, categorize men as warlocks, which is actually historically inaccurate. So warlock is actually um, a witch who has almost betrayed their coven and gone solo. Hmm. So it's technically not gendered. And a lot of people call men warlocks, even though that's incorrect. Um, and so I wanted to kind of put the world of witches into a male perspective um, rather than having it so much female dominated. But in this world, it is female dominated. So they don't know what to do with the first witch that's born as a male. Oh. And so that's that's basically what the theme of, well, that's really interesting. I had no idea that, you know, I always think of male witches as warlocks and not as witches. Um, so is that come from a, like a Celtic tradition of, do you know, or like, it, why do we get the idea then that, you know, is it that that it was just women, you know, like, it, seems um, like it, 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 I know the warlock thing stems from Hollywood's kind of right. vision of what a, a male witch is. Um, I actually don't know the history of them being just women uh, off the top of my head. I, I believe I've read it once or twice as to why. Um, but no, I don't actually know the answer to that. Yeah, probably it's like just some historical thing that just got distorted. More than likely, whatever, yeah. You no, know, and like, and you know, because when we think of witches, we think of like, I don't know, witch burnings, and you know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so would you like to read us something? Sure, I will read um, the prologue. That way, you can get like a basic idea to set the pace of what the book's about. The room was alive. Table shook, lights swayed, instruments fell. The delivery nurse with long painted nails and sweat dripping from the tip of her nose steadied the wailing woman from falling off the gurney. 
She lifted the arm rails and clicked them into place, providing the laboring woman with something to hold on to, giving her bruised hand some relief from the woman's vice-like grip. The other two nurses awaited further instruction from the doctor who steadied himself at the feet of the patient, looking more like he was ready to catch a football than a baby. Hold the gurney steady, he instructed one of them. The floor trembled as the earthquake gained strength. The door to the room swung open. It was the father. Without a word, he ran to the woman and wrapped his arm around her and wiped the dampness from her forehead. Plaster from the ceiling flaked onto the floor all around them. Nurse, the doctor yelled as he reached for the platform of tools on wheels that had just rolled out of reach during the commotion. The nurse hurried back to the table and put it into place. The panting woman screamed for her hospital bed despite being comforted by the father of her baby. She wanted a natural birth free of any forms of treatment that would ease her pain. She wanted her baby untouched by pharmaceuticals that could be transferred into the child's body from her own. She thought it selfish to want to numb the joys of childbirth, but at this moment, between heavy breathing, shaking walls, moving ceilings, and excruciating pain that could only be described as being ripped in two, she began to regret this decision. One more push, the nurse with the long, seemingly out of code acrylic nails said, urging the soon-to-be mother. With one final blood-curdling scream, the woman pushed her baby completely out, just as a blinding flash of lightning cracked across the sky from the window on the far end of the room. There was a deafening pop as the cabinet just behind the doctor tore halfway from the wall and crashed onto the foot of the nurse holding the bed still. She screamed in pain. It's a boy, the father, the doctor said, clearly relieved that the ordeal was over. The first baby I've ever delivered during an earthquake. He smiled, obviously exhausted and shaken. The father beamed with pride on seeing his new baby boy for the first time. The doctor handed the woman her baby as the nurse tinkered with the fallen cabinet mustering the strength to move it from her colleague's foot. What is this made of, she questioned as she struggled to heave the cabinet off. The doctor glanced back. Oak, he said, as he turned back to the parents. The father smiled and shook the doctor's strong, clammy hand. The mother's long strawberry blonde hair was plastered to her forehead from sweat, but a weight was lifted from her shoulders. She held her baby in her arms, knowing full well that the earthquake they had experienced was not natural. It was her son. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. And um, please buy Preston's book. It sounds awesome. And we'll look forward to reading it. And um, when you do your next book, I hope you'll come on again. Oh, great. Yes, I'd love to. Hey, thank you. And good luck. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. Okay, <laughs> we're off. All right. <laughs> hey, that was great. You did a great job. Oh, good. Thank you. And um, it's going to be on not this week, but next. So I will send you the um, the video so you can put it around or do whatever you like with it. Okay. Um, and we do put it up on the Florida site, which is where you, I think we saw you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And we put it all over the country. So hopefully, you know, you'll get some play. Yeah. And I'm certainly going to get it. I love fantasy and I like horror also. Um, and less science fiction for some reason. I don't know why. I'm not a big science fiction person either. You know. <laughs> But I think I first started reading um, uh, fiction, I mean, uh, fantasy with um, uh, some of the early women writers were doing some fantasy, like, what was the one where it was King Arthur's Court and Morgan? Do you know about that? It was written about in the perspective of Morgan in King Arthur's Court. And it was this whole fantasy world of, of her and King Arthur. And, um, and I, I really enjoyed that. So I sort of got into fantasy then. But anyway, um, good to see you. Yes, nice to meet you. Someday we'll be in Florida again, we hope. Uh, my cousin lives in Orlando. Oh, okay. And um, we often, we have friends who live in Lauderdale. So we go down there frequently. Oh, yeah. But how far is Orlando from... Lauderdale. 
It's a good distance. It's probably about three hours. Do you have a big gay scene around your your place? I know you had Pulse and all yeah, that. But... And so that really brought everyone together. And uh, yeah, they, that completely changed Orlando, like big time. I can imagine. And, and like, um, I just read recently that another bar closed in Orlando. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It was one of the oldest bars in Florida. Oh yeah, Parliament House. Parliament House, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't make it. Sad to see that go. Uh, is there any? Are there any other places to hang, or is it kind of just? Yeah, there's there's a the big place that kind of replaced Pulse is called Southern Nights. Uh huh. And that one just really replaced Pulse. They took all their bartenders in and all their um, security guards and everything, and they all work there now. Oh great. Well, hey Preston, we'll hang in there. All Enjoy right. Thank your you. cooler weather. Yeah, oh, I can't wait. <laughs> please, please send some of the warmer stuff up here. I've, yeah, you can have it. <laughs> we have a friend who lives in um, Plantation. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of uh, flooding down there. Oh, yeah, they got they got hit by that storm. Did you? No, not really, because we're so centralized. We just got a lot of rain, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, enjoy the amusement parks. I haven't been to mm -hmm. Disney since, I don't know, my kids were really little. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, now's not the time to go anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Take care. All right. Thank you. Well. Bye. During the final days of the most recent legislative session, there was a new group within the legislature that looked at coming together and actually doing some important work. And it's the Social Equity Caucus. And this was part of their mission statement. The mission of the Social Equity Caucus is to focus deliberately on improving outcomes for marginalized peoples. It is not enough to get rid of institutionalized inequality. We aim to institutionalize equity and inclusivity. So to talk to me, talk with me about this caucus and how it's gonna work and how we could get involved Please help me welcome back to All Things LGBTQ, Representative Emily Kornhauser from Wyndham 21. Welcome, Emily. Thank you. It's so nice to be here with you ish. <laughs> as much as we can these days. As much as we can. It's and it's be been fun. a long time since you've joined us. Mm -hmm. It has. It has. So, so first, I was going to say first, congratulations on your reelection. Thank you. I understand you might have had some nominal opposition, but first and foremost, what was it like trying to do a campaign in the era of COVID? So it wasn't just doing a campaign in the era of COVID, which has its own serious complications. It al was also doing a campaign while we were legislating. So usually the legislative session wraps up in April or May, and then we have the whole summer and fall to campaign, but we were still legislating through September this year. And so there are more ethical quandaries that get wrapped up in that process, but also just, you know, we're a citizen legislature. So many of us, myself included, had a job and then there's campaigning and legislating in a pandemic, a lot of extra constituent service, especially around unemployment insurance access. And then for those of us with families at home, we're at home with our entire family, which has its blessings, certainly, um, but also takes up a lot more time. It's, you know, the choice between a lunch meeting and a meet and lunch with the family becomes a little, um, more and, complex than we're sort of up in Montpelier. And then there's also what became the huge issue about childcare. Yes. Because all of the, the resources to which you would traditionally turn were gone. Mm -hmm. So I have a 15 year old and to be honest, when he was home doing school rather than at school, it actually saved He's very responsible. And so like the house was cleaner and the dishes were more done and he would like prep dinner and stuff. So it was actually, I'm not in that category. <laughs> it was, just, it's very nice when he's at home. Um, but 
to get back to your original question, the campaigning for me was really hard because I love campaigning. I loved it so much more than I thought I would during my first campaign because it was about really like connecting to people and hearing their stories and learning my community and walking down the road, knocking on doors. That's to me like the heart of campaigning. It's really intimate neighborhood parties and it's sitting on people's front steps with them. And none of that was available. Um, and so in some ways I ran what is a much more traditional campaign. I sent out mail. Um, it was much more detailed than I think campaign mail usually is. I didn't send sort of those flashy postcards with the picture on them. I sent a letter um, with much more language and detail. And then I sent a handwritten postcard. I called people on the phone, many people, and um, I hosted a Zoom community conversation every Saturday, which I've always done um, since the pandemic started. And before that, I did that in real life. So that was, and then like a lot of social media, you know, thrilling Instagram posts, compelling Facebook. I don't, it's, it was certainly a lot um, emptier than it usually is. I was gonna say what, one of the brief conversations we were having before we started taping was how Zoom during the session changed how decisions get made, how information is gathered, mm -hmm. you know, because you were there on Zoom, it was limited who could participate in those committee meetings. How can you take some of the things that you were just, just describing as part of your campaign and bring that with you when you go back into session in January because most likely this coming session is also going to be a Zoom oriented process. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of real benefits to the Zoom democracy in terms of transparency and access, especially for folks like me who are living in Brattleboro and my constituents are two hours away from Montpelier. So all of our committee meetings were available on YouTube and so I had constituents that would watch my committee meetings and then follow up with me via email afterwards and never would have been able to do that when we were in Montpelier. So that's a really incredible plus in access. What's challenging is, um, and what I think you're more familiar with, is really being in the state house and the level of access that gives you. So while people still have the same ability to testify via Zoom formally, the circle of folks that were sitting in the committee room usually and watching testimony who technically weren't witnesses and didn't necessarily have an official voice would often catch people on the way out of the door or um, often a lobbyist would raise an eyebrow to me during someone else's testimony to signal that they had another story to tell. Um, those like smaller, more intimate, subtle interactions are really gone when a few people are on Zoom together and everyone else is just watching via YouTube. And that's really hard. So I've been thinking a lot about how we can make more of those open spaces with each other. Um, you know, the cafeteria you mentioned before we came on is a place that I would honestly, it's a little overstimulating for me. It's a little too much like the high school cafeteria. I tend to not go in there very much. It's so many people talking that I can't really focus on individual conversations. Um, but I think we can make more open Zoom spaces like that with each other um, using technology. So maybe that's just like every day from 1230 to 130, there's one open Zoom room that people can pop in and out of to see if they can find each other. or Maybe that's like an end of the day, five o'clock, like people can all go into a Zoom room with a cup of tea or a drink. So like decompress at the end of the day and find each other. Um, there's, you know, technology like Slack that a lot of offices use to keep sort of, you know, ongoing different conversations going. So there are opportunities for that. Um, I was on a fairly large Zoom call yesterday. And I was texting with a friend of mine during the Zoom call. And a third person who is in that big Zoom call texted us both and said, I can see that you two are making each other smile. And she'd like noticed that the smiles were sort of like on a timed back and forth as if we were texting each other. And so 
I think there are, when we give into the technology a little bit, I think there are more opportunities than we're, than we think at first, but it still is. It's really hard. And it's um, in some ways more, in some ways it's a lot more vulnerable. So you had also mentioned that in addition to, you know, all of the social networking that you were just referencing, that you're also doing a weekly Zoom presentation. Mm -hmm. can, you tell me about, can you tell me about that? Yeah, so it's called the Montpelier Happy Hour. I started doing it with a local reporter named Olga Peters. Um, she had a regular radio show in Brattleboro for a long time. And right before, right after I was elected, she left that radio show. And we had been planning on having me come on, you know, every two weeks or so um, to just talk about politics. And when she left that radio show, we said, well, and she actually went to work for our local weekly, the Commons. We said, well, maybe we should make our own thing. And so we have a weekly show. It's called the Montpelier Happy Hour because we originally would talk sort of at the end of the day on Fridays and we'd have a signature cocktail and it was very exciting. Now it tends to be really early in the morning on Fridays. And so we toast our tea and coffee cups. But um, it was originally on community radio and then we turned it into a podcast. And since we've been in COVID, we started using Zoom video. And so we, I put it up on my YouTube page. We do a Facebook live event of it and we send it to our local community television station and they turn it into a TV show there. So that's been really fun. It's an hour long. We talk about sort of the stories and theories behind legislation that's happening and try to like really unpack, unpack the Montpelier. Pulling the curtain back and exactly. th th this, this is what the wizard has been up to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so building off that, Tell me about the Social Equity Caucus, because looking at the narrative that I got sent via fair and impartial policing, mm -hmm. this is something that our communities would be very interested in. And there's already a work group in process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Social Equity Caucus was started um, about a year and a half ago by Kevin Coach Christie, who's a rep from Hartford. Black man, he's been in the legislature for quite a long time. He's on the Judiciary Committee. And um, I think he originally invited people who he knew identified as part of some marginalized population. And so I don't know if I was invited for my Jewishness or my queerness. I never asked him. Um, or because you're a woman. Or because I don't think it was because I'm a woman because it wasn't, there were other women who weren't invented. I don't really know. I never asked him, um, but he invited a collection of people and um, began to sort of have conversations about what social, really like integrating social equity into legislation would look like in the state house. And then it's a new caucus, so it was hard for it to find its like right time. Every caucus has its time in the week. Um, and it's all very, those times have been the times for those caucuses for a very long time. And everyone knows that that's that caucus's time. And it sounds ridiculous to anyone outside of the building, but like culture and history is very important in the Vermont State House. So, um, but that's also one of the things that this group is trying to work to change. Exactly, exactly. So it was sort of funny to see it immediately come up against that, like what's the right time, what's the right place, how do we run ourselves? Um, and from the beginning, Coach Christie, who um, has really like, just owned this process. So I feel a little bit funny telling the story without him. But um, from the beginning, he was really clear that it was important for community members to have as much a seat at the table of this caucus as legislators. And all of the caucuses have some degree of lobbyists who attend and inform the discussion, but this was much more holistic. And so when we went um, into the pandemic and everything shut down, the Social Equity Caucus kept on meeting and many other caucuses didn't. And so that was a really important part of its sort of strength and um, energy. And then, you know, parallel to the pandemic, the murder of George Floyd and the incredible increase in the degree of national attention 
going to Black Lives, Black Lives Matter, um, criminal justice reform, violence, the new Jim Crow, all of that was really incredible. And the amount of political pressure that legislators who had not been thinking about these issues as much um, were experiencing from their community really meant that we were at a turning point as a legislature around these issues. And that was really, really exciting. And so the work of the Social Equity Caucus became much, much more important during that time to our peers. And Building off that, I mean, one of the conversations that I had started with you is, so how do we get Vermont's LGBTQ plus communities actively involved in work such as this? Mm -hmm. how, how would we access the caucus and how can we contribute to that? So the meetings are every Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Kevin Coach Christie, um, manages the mailing list and sends out invitations a little bit earlier in the week via Zoom. Um, folks are welcome to get in touch with me and I can forward their email if they don't wanna do the Googling. And, or I can send you the contact information after this, whatever works. Um, and then people can just attend and participate. The, definitely the emphasis right now is on race. We have um, picked up other issues as well. So when we were looking at um, extending benefits to migrant labor yep. um, because of the federal benefits, that was certainly an issue, the issue that came before the Social Equity Caucus. We, um, when Outright Vermont's funding was gonna be cut um, during the session, Social Equity Caucus came together to take a look at that. And so issues when they come through um, the social, that are relevant, the Social Equity Caucus definitely picks up. I mean, this sounds like a very opportune time for the LGBTQ plus communities be, to become actively engaged in a process such as this, because dealing with institutionalized racism within our communities is something to which we've waited too long to really pay attention also, hearing you describe how the, the Equity Caucus looks at pieces of legislation, I had wished I had known about this when they were doing the older Vermonters bill, because one of the issues that we had and we had presented to the committee was that when they do not identify a mandate to reaching out to underrepresented communities, we get forgotten. Yes. So you also have an incredible interest in total issues of equity, looking at, you know, part of your campaign stuff talked about financial resources being equitable and sufficient, mm -hmm. you know, equal access to healthcare, education, affordable housing. You had served on Ways and Means during the last session. You're hoping to go back onto Ways and Means? I am. I was assigned to Commerce when I first got to the legislature and actually right at the beginning of the pandemic, I was reassigned to Ways and Means and that's been really exciting. Um, sort of right at the crux of, in some ways, how we define households, how we define families, how we define beneficiaries. Um, I get really, I get really excited about tax policy because I, <laughs> It's for me, it's the crux of civilization. Like we come together and pool our resources for the greater good. Like that's, that's the point of civilization, right? And so that's taxes. And so talking about taxes in that way, I think is really important. And having someone who's looking at taxes from the perspective of marginalized communities, I think is also really important. So, you know, one piece in the governor's recent order about, um, you know, people sticking to their households. I was really struck by um, how unnuanced the defin the implied definitions were of family and household and how many people get left out by that or just don't even think of their own lives in that way. Um, and I think that extends to how we tax social security benefits, how we understand health insurance, how we understand, you know, taxes related to health insurance payments, um, the emphasis on marriage, all of that stuff becomes very important as Vermonters age, um, as new Vermonters come. All so it's fun. We have, we have a great deal of work to do. Thank you. 
for running for office, for coming back. As we're running out of time. Such we, a short show. We, I, <laughs> it's 15 to 20 minute interviews. We do three on, on each show. But uh, one of the things that I would like to invite you to do, invite you to participate in, mm -hmm. is I would like to have a conversation with several out legislators about the LGBTQ plus communities in Vermont's involvement in the political process and how we increase that. Let's and do we, that. And with that, thank you for thank coming you. back. Thank you for the work you're doing. And I'll, I'll be looking for you on Zoom. Sounds good, okay. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you in two weeks, but in the meantime, resist. resist.